Welcome to the Sky's the Limit with host D. Brown, the president and CEO of the P3 Group, the nation's largest minority public private partnership real estate developer. Here's D. to this episode of The Sky's the Limit. I'm your host, D. Brown, CEO. Joining me on the show today is the president and CEO of Torrance McKnight State Farm Insurance Agency. Torrance is a mover and shaker in the Atlanta, Georgia insurance market. Torrance, welcome to The Sky's the Limit, man. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Hey, man, I'm glad to have you on the show. Thank you, thank you. Now, Torrance, I'm really interested to kind of hear your journey to entrepreneurship uh, because I know that you are a highly educated uh, individual coming from corporate America, yes, uh, grew up in the rural Mississippi Delta, yes, and now you're moving and shaking and making things happen uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. So talk to me really about uh, your early years. What did you grow up and what was it like uh, where you come from? Yeah, sure, Mr. Brown. Actually, uh, I am a Torrance McKnight, a native of uh, Mount Bayou, Mississippi, one of the first all-black towns in the United States of America uh, with uh, great history, rich history in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, of course, there's many, many fine uh, cities there, but uh, Mount Bay is where I'm from uh, and grew up there, learned a lot of uh, things that I've learned, uh, life lessons about character, integrity, and so forth, and just been rewarding. I love where I'm from. Yeah, well, you know, here's an interesting thing, though. When you grew up, to, grew up in rural uh, communities like Mount Bayou, Clarksdale, around the area, I run, I was born in uh, Mount Bayou. Yep. Uh, you, you learn a lot about character. You learn a lot about discipline. Yes, sir. But it's very difficult to learn about entrepreneurship 100%. and business and those sorts of things. So when did you first kind of get a desire to want to go into business for yourself? It's a great question. Actually, early on as a kid, I always dreamed of it. When we grew up in my body, you saw a lot of black businesses and things like that. But you didn't understand the inner working. So over time, as I... Navigated through college, developed friendships in college, uh, ran into people like yourself and others who were uh, very successful at what they do. Actually, I sat around and asked a lot of questions like right. I did you. Pick up the <laughs> phone, call you early in the morning, right. and, and you would graciously take out time to talk to me like many others and really kind of feed my thirst of yeah. uh, knowledge. And that was very instrumental to me, helping me understand what I needed to do to prepare myself before I ventured out into entre entrepreneurship. So I tell people all the time that coming from a rural community, the place that you first really learn, in my opinion, mm -hmm. to be a champion and a, or a winner in life is through athletics. Absolutely. Right? Because there's no curriculum uh, that's in the classroom mm -hmm. that teach you to, to develop that heart of a champion. That's right. That teach you to overcome adversity mm -hmm. and try to win at all odds. So I know you played uh, yep. sports. Uh, growing up in uh, high school, college, and, and, and everything. So talk to me about how athletics influenced your uh, your life. Well, the way athletics actually, uh, you know, influenced me is uh, through having coaches who truly believed in you, uh, even when you didn't believe in yourself. Uh, you have some ups and downs in sports, as you know. Right. And uh, a lot of times you'll be faced with challenges, whether it be injuries, whether it be learning playbooks, different right. plays, different you know, techniques or strategies as you play your position. And what you, what I've learned is, is that you never give up. You never stop fighting. And I've carried that over into entrepreneurship, whereas if you want to be successful, if you want to be at the top of your game, you have to put in the work. And the work entails getting up early, which that contributed to me getting up early in the morning for practice. Yeah. Now I get up early in the morning to go to work, um, staying late after work. Um, I did that at practice, you know, stay late to kind of work on, you know, um, injuries if you had those, uh, strengthen workouts and yeah. things like that to get better. And then also understanding my sign, understanding my craft, getting better at my craft. I carry that to my job. You know, I'm not perfect, but each and every day I wake up with that champion mentality that, right. hey, I'm going to get better at what I did yesterday or the day before. And that has helped me and it's been tremendous. Right. And, you know, I tell people all the time that one of the biggest challenges that people have is not understanding what they're good at and what they're not good at. Because when you don't recognize that you need to work on your craft, 
or that you need to improve yourself in certain areas, yeah. uh, then you don't give that any attention. That's right. And so I'm going to kind of talk about sports for a minute yeah. and also talk about the community that sure. you come from for just another second as sure. well, because I think it's important for uh, our viewers and listeners to understand that you don't have to be born with a silver spoon right. in your mouth or come from uh, the best circumstances right. to be able to be successful in life. And so I was speaking to uh, a group of uh, high school uh, kids, mm -hmm. uh, football players that play for the high school that I played for. Yes, and so this is to kind of speak to or touch on what you talked about. And so I asked the group of kids, I said, who all in here want to play uh, football in college? And just about everyone raised their hand. And I said, well, who wants to play uh, in the NFL? And just about all of them raised their hands again. I said, well, who all came to practice two hours before everybody else today? And nobody raised their hand. Right. I said, who all stayed two hours late? Nobody raised their hand. So I said, now, you got, you know, 3,000 people looking for, we got 300,000 people <laughs> looking for the same job that only got 3,000 openings. Yep. How are you going to get selected if you're not willing to go the extra mile? You're not willing to come in early and stay late. I mean, how, how are you going to give yourself that competitive advantage? And so it goes back to the work ethics uh, component of it. Sure. And so where did you, where did you feel like you learned your work ethics from? Where did you get that? I got that from growing up in Mississippi Delta. Uh, we, you know how it is. We yeah. grew up in Mississippi Delta, small towns. You know, uh, like today, these kids, you know, that's growing up, no knock on it, it is what it is. We didn't have, you know, on, on weekend or during the week, you're doing homework, you're going to practice, whatever sports you're in. When you got done, you had chores at home. Right. You know, you're washing dishes, you're sweeping the floors. On Saturdays, man, your parents woke up playing the Isley Brothers. Right. Or, uh, or you know, some blues music, Johnny Taylor or something. Yeah. But they had the windows up. I mean, they had, you know, the guys, we was in there, man, scrubbing toilets. Yeah. You know, you learn how to clean, you learn how to cook yeah. at a really early age. And I, re I can recall, I used to ask my mother for, uh, to purchase me uh, some Air Jordans one time. Yeah. She said, but you know how much Air Jordans cost? I said, Mother, they the coolest thing everybody got. Them. <laughs> she said, So I guess just because everybody got them, you want them. I said, Yeah, I do. <laughs> she said, Well, you don't know what other people did to get those joys. Right. I thought about it. But I didn't think about it. I thought about it. Yeah. So she said, I'll tell you what you do. You're 14, you want a pair of Jordans. I think at the time, Jordans were like $150, I believe yeah. it was. And she said, I'll tell you what you do. This summer, when you're ready to go back to school, you're going to go chop cotton. And uh, we had a guy, Chef Mississippi, that's come around, pick all the kids up. Yeah. We go chop cotton. We went out there, man, chop that cotton. We was out there at four in the morning. to probably like, I think it was like, we ain't making a hike home about five or six that evening. And each day you get $25 a day. If your hoe broke, you had to spend money on them getting the whole food. Right. If you didn't bring nothing to eat, you had to spend that. By the time I got home, man, <laughs> I ain't had $25. <laughs> so I'm saying all that to say, that work ethic came from, you know, even though I hated going to the cockpit, it taught me a value right. lesson about money. Right. And entrepreneurship taught me, you know, that taught me about, hey, just because you make $25, you can't go spend 25 right. right. So if you make 25 you got to save some of that money. Right. And I carried that over to uh, my business practice and managing my profits and loss, my P&Ls and my budgets, is that you got to actually uh, be in the green. You can't yeah. be in the, in the red. So... There's so many of those little small principles like that that are built on me. Yeah, I would say this because uh, 50 years old, I got my first pair of Jordans last year. I always <laughs> said, and I know y'all say this guy got some, you know, some right. pretty extravagant things. <coughs> I always said I was never going to buy right, a Jordan, right. right? And my son gave me a pair of Jordans for my, I guess it was my birthday or Christmas, right. but it was maybe in Father's Day. Mm -hmm. But I've never worn them. I told him I'm going to put them in a, in a case and, <laughs> and display them, but... But so that's my Jordan story. But I remember being a young kid growing up in you know in Clarksdale and watching my mom work sixteen hours a day, twelve hours a day, watching people in my community, you know, older people, you know, that had college degrees, etc., go chop cotton in the summertime or you know uh, to to make extra money. So uh, you always saw or had to participate in you know hard work, um, and so you kind of fast forward, you go to college. Uh, talk to me about college and what your degree and background is in education. Yeah, uh, actually, you know, weird, funny story. It's like, uh, you know, some people, 
Um, one of the things I value in, in success stories is people when they tell you good, bad, and you know? right. And that's one of the things I value from people like yourself. You, you not only teach us or tell us about how to, how to be successful, but you also talk about how there are some things that can go up and down and the pitfalls that can happen right. or beware of those things. Right. And like for me, uh, when I was in college, I first started out, you know, I struggled at first because I wasn't focused yeah. in college. And I messed around and got bad grades. And uh, I had to refocus. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, you know, in business, you're going to you're gonna have some of those good times. And then even in the good times, you have to refocus the lens. And right. Every now and then, right. you have to re, redial your coordinates or your right. lens right. to actually refocus to keep the business trending up right. versus it trending flat right. uh, to grow. And that's what I did in college. Uh, but I got those the first year, got those two bad grades. I started to understand how my GPA is impacted by my letter grade. Yeah. So when I started to understand that, then what I started to do is plan and better prepare and do better to improve on that. And I remember telling some friends of mine who are now fraternity brothers, I said, man, you know what? I would never put myself in that situation again. But I learned from it. And ever since then, it's always dawned on me that when you know the rules, you can play the game. Right. But when you don't know the rules, and you just out there. You got there on your own. I tell yeah. you. And you know, that's interesting because so many people uh, don't take the time to read or learn, uh, to, to understand. That's right. And I always seem to be amazed mm -hmm. at the number of experts yep. in, in subject matters who don't have their own you know, right. lives under control. And so I think that's something that a lot of people can learn from is that, you know, you, you have to study, you have to research, you have to try to make yourself better. That's right. Or, or you will find yourself either flatlined or yeah. trending down in life and not really constantly trying to elevate yourself. So from a motivation perspective, uh, who has motivated you through the years to want to uh, really excel in life? Well, first of all, my mother, my father, or of course God, yeah. and the people that I've come in contact with. You know, uh, I'm sure you heard this before. Your circle of friends, that's right. people you hang around, that's right. can determine your trajectory in life. That's right. And God has been good to me that I've interacted with people who always wanted to see other people win. Right. And I'm allergic to stupidity. <laughs> uh, the older I get, I'm allergic to stupidity. Yeah. I'm allergic to uh, foolishness. Uh, and I strive to help people. Because somebody did it for me. There are people right. like, you know, uh, Mr. Willis Simmons, uh, Senator Willis Simmons. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I can name a bunch of Benny Thompson, uh, yourself. Uh, you know, you got your uh, Mike Espy's of the world. And, you know, of course, Barack Obama. And, you know, I was truly a big fan of uh, so many people, you know. But it's one of those things that I read a lot, too. Martin Luther King, you know, these yeah. people who have fought for... The, the, you know, for us as people, right. uh, to be better. Now, of course, there's other people that have, have that I that I probably haven't mentioned, but there's so many people that contribute. Those are the ones that I look up to who have been, you know, I've read about. Uh, They've been willing to feed you information to help you be a better person. Right. And when you find those type of people and you put them in your circle, or you read about them and see what they've done, you begin to want to mirror your life after those individuals right. to do. Uh, the positive things in life for those people, right? So uh, you had a you know good professional career uh, working in education and corporate America. Uh, what made you want to step out and become an entrepreneur? Uh, guys like yourself, uh, guys like yourself, uh, Mr. Terrence Harris, Lou Jackson, uh, longtime friend, uh, kind of like a brother, many other people, and I read a lot. So yeah. when I read. I read about smart money. I, I read, you know, Warren Buffett, yeah. those type of guys. And when you see uh, how they did it and how it started, it makes you want to be successful. Right. Uh, it makes you want to, you know, seek that knowledge to understand, okay, uh, you know, in starting my business, uh, what kind of business I want to start? Who's the specialist in those businesses? Right. Uh, who are doing it? And 
you know, making money. Not the right. people just doing it. Right. Don't go broke right. tomorrow. Right. Uh, and that's the type of information I sought out. And when I saw those things, I gravitated to those type of people. Right. You know what I mean? And when I gravitate to those people, I'm like a sponge, you know. But I don't go to them to sponge up all they have. I go to them open to see if they need me to do something. Right. Because so many times relationships are one sided. But uh, for me, I'm a loyal friend. Yeah. And to a fault. If I'm your yeah. friend, I'm your friend. Right. Right. You know. So that 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 that's me. You know. But uh, people like yourself that are open to help people who want to listen. Yeah. And want you know, there's a lot of people say I want help. But they yeah. want you to do it for them. Not right. work like right. They want, or, or they want you to tell them what to do, but they right. still want to do it their way. Right. It don't work like that. It don't that. work like that. It's right work. And, and if they if they could do it the way they want to do it, then they don't need your help. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. right. You know, uh, I tell people all the time, I'm not opposed to letting people run into a brick wall if that's what they choose to do. That's I try right. to help you if you want help, but if you that's want right. to run into a brick wall, I'm not a, you know, not opposed, opposed to you just going ahead and doing that. That's right. And so one of the things I want to just kind of touch on is that, you know, growing up in... Uh, a small community like we did, uh, you see people in business. You know, you have these you know small business owners, uh, and so then you go out, you get a business for yourself, and you say, you know what, I, I want to have something that's more structured, something more mm-hmm. corporate, mm-hmm. and you're willing to step out and do uh, things a little bit different. And I know for you, uh, going to business, you selected to be a part of the State Farm pa- uh, family. So talk to me about that decision, and then tell me about. Uh, the Torrance McKnight Agency and, mm-hmm. and the type of products you all uh, uh, sell? Well, um, insurance, it was one of those things that I always heard so many great things about, but just kind of like sat on the fence about it. And then uh, I was in banking, higher ed, and then uh, I know I came to you and talked to you about it, and you told me how you've seen it work and so forth, which that's one of those sharing pieces, uh, but you got to be willing to go ask too. You right. can't be sitting back. Right people come to you because like, you had the knowledge I wanted and, and several others. So I wanted to, uh, so I have to talk with people like yourself and I did my research. Uh, then I actually sat down and sought it out and talked to some folks that were in, within the company, uh, State Farm and learned from them and asked a lot of questions, took a lot of notes and I digested. Yeah. And I, was able to put together a business plan, solid business plan, uh, and uh, thought it through, prayed about it, and um, uh, God blessed me with that journey. Once I got that journey, man, I ain't letting it go. Yeah, man, I ain't letting it go. I, mean, I got it in a chokehold. Right? <laughs> and uh, anytime I put myself, I'm like you. Anytime I set out and put my goal to doing something, I'm gonna do it and be the best at it. Right. And uh, uh, right now, uh, I do currently own a State Farm agency. Uh, in Roswell, Georgia. Uh, our agency actually serves five states, which include Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, Tennessee, and Florida. Uh, we actually uh, sell products uh, in pretty much all categories, uh, in auto, uh, fire, life, and health. Uh, one of the biggest things uh, that I've learned in insurance has been we're in a need-based uh, uh, selling process for our customers. So we don't just sell you an insurance policy just to sell you insurance, right? So we deep dive into your situation, ask you a lot of questions to understand you as a customer's needs. So when we understand the customer's needs, that's how we determine what products and services that we actually have right. that can help your specific need. And then we customize your insurance plans to fit you. Right. You know, you hear so many horror stories about whether it's people uh, dying uh, who have no insurance or not enough insurance or people who have catastrophic loss of uh, property uh, that is either uninsured or, uh, or, or not insured. Mm-hmm. Why is it important for people to understand the value of and utilize insurance products to help mitigate the risk that everyday life has for mm-hmm. us all? That's a great question. So. It's very important that consumers take the time to understand what their needs are, what risks they're trying to protect, so that they can actually ensure that they got the right product right. for them. Right. You know, I may not have the right product for, for whatever reason, but definitely that's what they want to always make sure they find the insurance company that fit their needs at that time. Right. And the reason why insurance products are key, so for example, with auto insurance, 
a lot of people sometimes don't realize that, yes, it may be cheaper to get a lower liability limits, but the risk that's associated right. is what they have to be uh, understanding of. Right. So, for example, you know, you have those three numbers in the liability category, which the first number, uh, as an example, could be 25000 uh up to 25000 in bodily or medical injury per individual, up to 50000 uh in bodily or medical injury per accident, and the last number, which can be up to $25,000 in property damage. Well, some people may say, well, hey, you know, um, that's all I need. But what they don't realize is if you're in a accident, right, let's use me as an example, you as an example, Mr. Brown. And let's say, for instance, I'm driving down the road, I hit Mr. Brown. If I hit Mr. Brown's car, he's driving one of those nice, fancy Bentleys, right? That car is going to run you about a quarter million dollars, right? right? So if I'm hit, if I hit your car and I only have 25, 50, 25, well, I'm in bad shape yeah, right. because the property damage, that 25000 that last number, is what says that if Mr. Brown tries to sue me and I need to fix his car, I ain't got the 25000 If I damage that Bentley pretty good, probably put a little scratch on it or something, who knows? Right. That can run me well, that can run me well over 25000 right. right. But what the customer doesn't realize or the consumer in this example, they don't realize that anything over that liability limit, that 25000 that's got to come out of their pocket. Right. You're liable for it. They're liable for you. And that's where when they're held liable for that and uh, their checks can be garnished up to the age, in some cases, up to the age of 65, to the age of 65, and then they can keep garnishing it, right? So some people don't realize those type of risks that are associated with it that can impact them financially for the rest of their lives. Right. Uh, yeah. So insurance is really critically important uh, for us uh, to help mitigate risk, and we use it you know, professionally to mitigate all types of risk. For sure. Um, and, you know, uh, from a just life perspective, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, people, especially in communities of color, mm -hmm. uh, don't have adequate life mm -hmm. insurance to uh, protect their family and loved ones in the event that they um, experience an untimely uh, mm -hmm. death. Uh, why is it important that people really evaluate life insurance and how that can uh, benefit them and uh, protect their family? Great question. So many people think life insurance is just about, oh, I'm about to die, somebody's about to come up on me. No, that's not necessarily true. Uh, life insurance, as you heard me talk about earlier, can serve customized needs. It, it's need-based, right? So it's based upon the customer's needs. So, for example, you know, when we like, uh, first of all, we, when we're actually speaking to a customer about life, we talk to that customer about life insurance based upon their need. So we take we do a deep dive taking a look at, you know, uh, uh, we use a company called Lemra. And Lemra is a company that, you know, says that, hey, you know, uh, a person should have at least five times their annual salary uh, in life insurance plus in the day, right? So that's a quick reference, right? But at State Farm, what we do, we take a look at uh, we use the life uh, needs analysis, which yeah. is called life needs analysis. And we use the life uh, acronym, L-I-F-E. So we look at, you know, um, we look at what kind of life insurance a person has in place. We look at their income. We look at any final expenses they need to take care of, yeah. those type of things. And what we do when we actually collect all that information by asking so many questions about the customer, understanding their situation, then we come to a realization and say, hey, this is how much life insurance you need. Now, when we identify how much life insurance we need to have, that number can be big to a customer, right? Yeah. But it's always good for the customer to, one, understand how much they need. Yeah. So that even if they don't buy it now, at least they got it in their mind. Right. Then it's like you always say, educating people. Right. 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 So once you educate a person, then you find the budget that fits that customer's need. So as I talked about earlier, to create that personalized plan for that customer. Right. So then that's where we actually thought out and we run the life insurance quotes for that need. And then if they say, well, my budget for the month is $50 or $100. Okay, let's get more realistic. Let's drop that amount to find something that fits that budget. Right. And if that budget and that need fit for that customer, 
then we found a solution at that time. Right. And then they know down the line when they reevaluate it, they can go ahead and lock in some life insurance now, but later on down the line, they can add more if they need be and right. so forth. One of the other things you uh, talked about and I want to highlight was when it comes to life insurance, it's not necessarily about just about death. There are, we have some life insurance policies. First of all, we have several types. We have whole life policies. We have term policies right. and we have universal life policies. One of the things about it is with the uh, uh, whole life policy, they carry cash value right. uh, plus a death benefit. And in the event of an untimely death, the beneficiary receives not only the death benefit, but the cash value. Now, we look at it like a living benefit and a death benefit. The death benefit is if they, if they have an untimely death, they get the death bit, whatever's left over. However, the living benefit is while the person's paying in a little bit more money, the insurance companies are, are actually investing that money to make sure it actually generates right. the end of your income that it says or cash value that it says it will that's listed in the illustration. Right. Now, the customer also should know they can pretty much actually borrow against that. You know what I mean? So that really helps the customer. Uh, we also have some uh, uh, what is called twin, it's called juvenile policies for kids mm -hmm. that I think is so underused uh, in the uh, African American community because those are policies that can actually, a person can purchase for their kids at an early age, invest in them really early, only pay on it for X number of years. After that, they don't have to make any more payment after a certain period of time. But they're building a nest egg, which is the cash value for a right, kid, right. as well as they're having a life insurance policy in the event that something happens. But the big piece is, let's say for that kid gets some type of medical situation down the line. Yeah. They already have life insurance locked in. Right. You see what I mean? Right. And then if the parent who purchased it has his own, that person can actually, that's their policy, that's that kid's policy. So they can transition over to themselves. Right. So those are the ways that they can really win. Then you have the term policy. The term policy is just what they are. They're actually there for a certain number of years. Yeah. Once, once it runs its course, at the end of it, you get nothing back. Now, we do have one that's called a return of premium. So it, it, it's just like a uh, term policy. However, at the end of that term, if the person that lives it, we return all the premium back to the customer right. and so forth. And then you have your universal life policies, which are a little bit more flexible policies. Uh, they're higher risk, but we do offer those as well. So people may take a look at, at you today and say, wow, here's a successful uh, businessman that, you know, has had a, a successful uh, professional career, transitioned to entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and, and you're doing extremely well. But we all know that in life we have uh, challenges and obstacles yes. we have to overcome yes. to get from point A to point B. What are some of the significant challenges or obstacles you've had to overcome to get to where you are today? Man, I've, I've had um, a gazillion of challenges, and, probably, and I know we'll always have challenges. Yeah. But one of the things in the way I get over challenges, uh, I take them head on. And um, of course, I got God on my side, so that's 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 uh, meaningful always. But what I do, I always learn from any mistakes that I make. Um, it, anything I do, I'm always reevaluating it yeah. uh, to determine how I could have did it better, how I could have handled that situation better. Uh, and I think that over the years and over time, things that I felt like I could do better, I always go back to the drawing board, yeah. uh, reevaluate, figure it out, and then have good counsel. You know, right. I, I talk to people. Torrance, I know that uh, giving back to your community uh, is very important mm -hmm. and that you uh, do a lot. Uh, to support the community that you're from. And you're also a member of the uh, greatest fraternity in the world, Kappa Alpha Psi, uh, Fraternity Incorporated, my frat. Uh, and and uh, I want to understand from you uh, just how important has Kappa Alpha Psi been uh, in your personal uh, and professional life and why is it important for you to give back to your community? Yeah, so uh, Kappa Alpha Psi is, as you said, one of the greatest uh, fraternities in the world, if not the greatest fraternity in the world. Um, with Kappa, 
uh, been a member of Kappa since 1997 this spring and across at Young State University. And um, one of the greatest things that Kappa has taught over time uh, throughout the years has been leadership. Uh, it's taught uh, the importance of community service through college. Uh, even, even I served in student government associations and things like that when I was in college. And all of those things really help, but Kappa helps set the foundation for uh, where I am today. Um, I've developed a lot of mentors uh, in Kappa who have served in, uh, in our highest level of ranks in Kappa, all the way to different uh, regional, provincial uh, um, offices and so forth. And uh, a lot of that wisdom has transitioned over to me over the years and has been very successful. I still call on some of those guys uh, who I uh, truly look at as mentors, very close friends. As it relates to like my uh, entrepreneurship and work, I always give back. I'm always in the community sponsoring golf tournaments, uh, some schools. I actually partner with um, in my uh, hometown, not hometown, but in my uh, where I live, my family lives. I sponsor uh, the high school football program uh, and so forth. As you and I talked about how important that is because right. those kids are coming through ranks like we did. And when you're able to help impact those kids in a positive way, right. that means a lot. And it means a lot to me to actually be a young African-American man who comes from humble beginnings like we all have right. uh, to be able to give back to the kids and let them actually, you know, propel or excel uh, off of something that we've actually worked hard right. for. So that, that's meaningful. As it relates to like uh, uh, just giving back, you know, time, serving time, I love to give back. And as you know, people like us from Mississippi, we're a little different than most. You know, many people don't like me to say that, but I, I, I'm, a, I'm a straight shooter. I believe that. We don't have to tell everything we do. We do some things because we know that's the right thing to do. And uh, we come from communities in Mississippi where you were taught that if you do the right thing, right gonna follow. Right. When you do wrong, wrong gonna follow. Right. So I live by those old principles. I'm I'm a young cat, but I'm old at heart, and I believe in those type of principles. Yeah. Look, I I want to uh, close the show out by asking you just one final question. Okay. And I I want to know just really what would you like for your your legacy to be at the end of the day? Brian, you know, thinking about that, I really would like. When, when my time on this earth is finished, I want people to know that I'm a person who will always shoot it straight from the hip every time, right? And I hope people value that in a way that, not of arrogance, not of stupidity, but to a point where you always know where a person stands. And you can agree to disagree with a person. And I hope that people learn something from me, just like I learned from everybody I come in contact with. But also to know that you know, uh, I'm always here to uh, help anybody I can. Uh, I'm a loving person. Uh, I love to treat people right. I love to have fun. I love to make money. Uh, and I love nice things. And uh, so I just want people to know that I'm just a good person. Yeah. Good Mississippi boy. Listen, we need straight shooters, right? Because, <laughs> and because sometimes you see people do things. You say, you telling me, everybody around you. Nobody told you that was a bad idea. <laughs> they just watched you do it. So uh, right. I tell people within my company all the time, like, I don't need a bunch of yes men. That's right. Right. You know, somebody has to. That doesn't mean that every suggestion or recommendation right. you get, you take it. But you got to hear all of uh, diversity of uh, ideas That's and right. opinions so that you can make the best and most informed uh, opinions. So, uh, Torrance, man, it's been a pleasure yes, to have you on the show, man. I really yes. enjoyed it. Uh, to my viewers, thank you for watching this episode of The Sky's the Limit with D. Brown, CEO. This has been The Sky's the Limit with D. Brown, CEO. To find out more about D, go to dbrownceo.com or Google D. Brown, CEO. To connect with the P3 Group, check out the p 3 groupincom The Sky's the Limit is a self-made TV original production.